guys, I am Davey Wavy, and I am here with my real life doctor, Dr. Jay Gladstein, and we are going to answer some questions that you guys have that you're too embarrassed to ask your doctor. So are you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. The first question is, and this is asking for a friend, does having anal sex actually stretch out your anus? It can to some insignificant extent. Doing things more extreme, fisting, can lead to some problems in terms of loss of control of the bowel, but anal sex will loosen things up a little bit, but not loosen things up to the extent that it causes any sort of problem. No diapers. No <laughs> diapers. Will says, can a dick ever be too big? <laughs> hey, I'm just asking for the people. I say, would say that that's in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> All right. But I can't imagine how. <laughs> Hannibal wants to know, is frequent douching bad for your body? Frequent douching is not bad for your body. Is there anything that people should be douching with? Like, is it Generally just, just plain water. But douching, for the most part, is only going to get water into the lower part of the uh, anal canal and rectum. Mm -hmm. So it's really not going to cause any major issue with the rest of the gut. So after douching, sometimes douching can actually stimulate other stuff to happen, more release of more stool. Okay. So there's a little bit of an art to it. Just douching a couple times should be sufficient. And then a wet finger put up there, kind of move it around. You can put it up there a couple of times without any lubricant, without any soaps in particular, should be enough to be good enough for government work. The art of douching, that's my follow-up video. Rocky wants to know, why are some guys physically able to bottom and others not? Is it really a matter of willpower or are some guys just built for it? Well, that's a very difficult question. That has a lot to do with everybody's bowel habits. Everybody's okay. a little bit different. Some people are regular, some people tend to be irregular. Some people have what we call irritable bowel syndrome, and we hold a lot of emotions in our guts. So some people just have a hard time releasing, a hard time relaxing, and it's a, it's a whole complex interaction between what we eat, what our emotions are like. Some people are just gifted. So Chris wants to know, is it important to tell your doctor that you are gay? And if so, how do you go about doing that? That was Chris. Mm -hmm. Another difficult question, Chris. <laughs> it is important to let your doctor know that you're gay so that your doctor can have a better idea of what, what has an impact on your health. Uh, a big thing that can impact health has to do with sexual health. And, and I think it's important to let a doctor know to focus his or her attention on sexual health. But having said that, I can't, I, I don't know how different doctors react to that. Doctors tend to be a little bit conservative as a group. And so some doctors may be uh, receptive and others may just sort of shut down. Hmm. So I do think it's important, but but that doesn't mean that the reception that people get out there in the world is necessarily going to be welcoming. And if it's not welcoming, maybe it's find a good time to find else. someone. Yeah. yeah. Travis wants to know, why can't sexually active gay men give blood? Okay, that's a very good, in that's a very good question, Travis. The HIV e epidemic first came to light in 1981, uh, and, then, and then it sort of steamrolled in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of fear. Within a couple of years, the virus was identified, and it was in the mid-1980s when the American Red Cross made a policy that any man who has had sex with another man since 1979 cannot give blood. That was reversed within the last year, in 2015, and gay men can give blood as long as they are HIV negative, and don't have hepatitis B, and don't have hepatitis C, and, hear this audience, they have not had sex within the last year. So. Basically, most gay men can't, can't still can't get give blood. blood, and it's just due to policy reasons. Wow. So that bias still 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 exists. Still exists. All right. We tried to lighten it up a little bit, but not, yeah. not very far. There's your answer, Travis. That's it, Travis. Ron wants to know: Does bottoming cause hemorrhoids? Bottoming can cause hemorrhoids. Yes. Okay. Is there any way to prevent that? Well, uh, hemorrhoids are common, and they come and go, for the most part. As a, as most people get hemorrhoids at some point in their lives. Hemorrhoids are due to pressure in the anus. And that pressure can come from the inside or from the outside. It can come from a penis. It can come from straining too hard. Almost all pregnant women get hemorrhoids. So the way to prevent it would be to use a lot of lube to, to, to warm up slowly, to not force things in, to not, sorry folks, to not go at it too hard. If hemorrhoids happen, treat them. Okay, be gentle with your bottoms. So does bottoming increase your risk of prostate cancer, Cody wants to know. Bottoming does not increase risk of prostate cancer. Okay. That's a myth. 
That is a myth. I've heard that as well. Yeah. yeah. It's a complete myth. Okay. Andre says, I love having sex. And I have Good sex for you, Andre. three to four times a day with my boyfriend. That's a lot, Andre. Is that too much? Am I sick? And should I see a doctor? You got a lot of time on your hands, Andre. <laughs> but I would not say that you are sick and on the surface. Have fun. I want to I wanna be Andre's boyfriend. <laughs> Bussy wants to know, is the stigma of having many sexual partners justified or is it actually more harmful? Well, that's, that's a loaded question. That's a loaded question and that's another challenging question. Certainly having more sexual partners can put a person at greater risk of STDs, but it depends who your sexual partners are. Right. And then and does where that you meet them and what you do with them. And does that justify the stigma? I would say no, it doesn't justify stigma. I think stigma about most most things in the world is not justified right. because stigma is essentially just a form of of, uh, of bias and shaming and, and shaming. Yeah. It doesn't lead to any good. Having lots of sexual partners could be that that's that's your sport and that's what you like to do. Uh, it could be a sign of of desperate loneliness and looking for something that you can't really find. But that's I, I can't say it's yeah. going to be different for every individual. So Hugo wants to know. Can you get STDs from swallowing semen? The word was not semen, but we're in a doctor's office. Can you get STDs from that? You can get STDs from swallowing semen and from swallowing whatever the other word was <laughs> using the doctor's office. What STDs could they get from that? Syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, possibly hepatitis B, Possibly, but not a very high risk of HIV. It's a nice cornucopia of uh, STDs. Yeah, 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 a decent number of STDs. All right. Can changing your diet really change the taste of semen? I do not know the answer to that question. Right. I recommend that the, the more research. Is yes, needed. more research needs to be done. All right. Jason says, if you are HIV undetectable, what are your chances of transmitting HIV? So that's a very good question, Jason. And I can't really give you a numerical answer. Like I can't say it's one in a thousand or one in 10,000 or one in a hundred thousand. We just know that that's an extraordinarily rare event. Mm -hmm. The example that I often use is that most people that are listening to this or watching this video have probably flown on a plane before or driven in a car before. And nobody is going to give anybody a guarantee that when you get on a plane that it won't crash or when you get in a car that you're not going to get in an accident and die. But we do know that if you're careful, that the risk versus benefit analysis is probably okay. So this is the final question. Okay. Paul wants to know, why is gay sex so fun? We can end on a happy note. <laughs> well, Paul, again, I would say more research needs to be done. <laughs> and I invite you to look into that question and let us know what you find. So a huge thank you to Dr. Gladstein for doing this and I'm gonna put a link to your website down below because you're the coolest doctor in the world. Uh, I would encourage you guys to have these conversations with with your doctor even though they might be a little bit uncomfortable or embarrassing. You may want to start a little bit slow <laughs> and not necessarily ask them whether or not fisting is going to lead to incontinence of stool. Test them out, see how they are in talking about your sexual health and then go from there. Well, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Bye guys. Bye.